Okay, the second panel today deals with domestic, after we've looked at the collapse of the European whatever system. And I always remember Robert Triffin always used to talk about these non-systems, and we're now in Europe getting a non-system. What we have in the US we will find out by our distinguished panel, and without further introduction, because you have all of the bios in your uh, program, so I don't have to waste time doing this, so I will ask Seth to start out by giving his assessment of just exactly how you make sense of what's happening currently in the, in the U.S. economy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Randy and, and, and Dimitri, uh, for the formal invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, so talking about financial policy, domestic financial policy, I uh, wanted to take a little bit of a flexible interpretation, but hopefully it will be timely with a lot of the debates that are going on now uh, in financial markets, in politics. Uh, I think I heard Randy in the beginning say he was going to talk a bit about the Green New Deal, and so I'm sure this will have a very small amount of overlap, but nevertheless sort of maybe prime people's appetites for it. And it's about the intersection of debt management, monetary policy, what the link is there. Um, and I think the current debate going on now in markets, in the press, in politics about modern monetary theory, what it is, what it is not, uh, um, how much of a divergence it is from standard economic theory, um, uh, should force people to think a lot about the interaction between debt management and monetary policy, especially when it comes to a central bank that has used its balance sheet very aggressively as a tool for policy, has said the balance sheet was going to stay on the table as a tool for monetary policy uh, in the future for the next downturn. Uh, and for me, it's deeply personally uh, important because I spent 15 years of my life at the Federal Reserve in, 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 in DC. By the time I left, I was Deputy Director of Monetary Affairs and worked on all of the expansion of the balance sheet uh, and did the first couple of rough drafts that eventually got balled up and thrown away for how to exit the balance sheet. I left and went to the Treasury Department, was Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets and oversaw the Debt Management Office. So all of these things are sort of deeply ingrained in my, my, my psyche. I'll also make one additional comment. Uh, I will every so often allude to where there are current legal or accounting or political constraints. All of those are just a reflection of where we are now. They're not in any way immutable laws of economics or physics or anything like that. And I think part of where the current debate is talking past each other is that people are different on um, different layers of how much you're willing to look through current convention, current rules, current laws, all of which could clearly be changed, and they haven't always been the same way. It's one area where I think economic historians tend to have a lot to teach current policy makers. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I am a big believer in institutions and rules, and so one needs to understand what the current rules are before thinking about how you want to change things. So just walking a little bit back in history, before the crisis, life was boring. <laughs> uh, I remember in 2002, my boss at the time came into my office and said, closed the door and said, I have an opportunity for you to excel, which is Federal Reserve speak for shit flows downhill. Um, and, it was, and it was that somebody in monetary affairs had to be responsible for the Fed's balance sheet, and at the time, precisely two people in the world cared. Uh, it was me and the accountant, head accountant across the street. The general counsel only cared if we were late publishing it every week. But of course, that world changed uh, in 2008. But if you think about what was going on, the Fed was, at that point, buying treasury securities on an outright basis just about every single week, but the numbers were so small it didn't seem to matter. Some week, some months it was nothing, and the average month was maybe $2 billion per month. Uh, the balance sheet was increasing just at the same rate as currency, physical paper currency was increasing. Uh, I find it interesting, and that's a wonderful historical analog, that was a point where effect effectively what the Federal Reserve was doing was swapping one liability of the central government, uh, treasury debt, for another liability of the central authority, currency and circulation. And the market, the population, the, all private actors were perfectly happy with that exchange uh, at, at, at current prices because no one seemed to pay any attention to it. And that's going to be the first time I mention what I think of as sort of one of the interesting philosophical uh, nuggets to, to, to wrestle with, which is the distinction that, as far as I can tell, most intro macro textbooks make in very, very bright lines between money and debt. A little bit of a funny dichotomy from my perspective. They're both liabilities of the central authorities. Uh, they have some differences. People always say, well, yeah, 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 but money has maturity of zero and it's perfectly liquid. Uh, I might 
conversation. And moreover, there are plenty of places now that are credit card only where you can't use currency. Uh, and so the idea that currency, that money somehow measured is always more liquid than debt somehow other measured is, is sort of a, a funny dichotomy. Anyway. At that point, Treasury Department also didn't have a very clear strategy for debt management. Uh, that's a little bit heretical, but not, in, not at all incorrect from my perspective. They more or less tried to keep coupon sizes about constant, and they adjusted for swings in cash needs by adjusting the amount of Treasury bills outstanding. In the extreme, it mattered for markets, but most of the time it didn't matter very much. So you take the late 90s and into 2000, 2001, the deficit was falling, falling, falling. Eventually, we got to the surplus. Um, and eventually the Treasury cut back and then canceled the 30-year bond, the market cared. And you could see pricing in the market for 30-year bonds go up relative to what would be implied from all other similar uh, uh, instruments. And it turns out that market pricing is still evident today. If you look at the term structure of Treasury securities, there's still a hole from where Peter Fisher killed the 30-year. The um, that's going to go away over time as things age out. But nevertheless, um, in terms of market pricing, supply of different maturities of debt matters. Um, it matters because they are substitutes, but they are not perfect substitutes. And exactly how that plays out has evolved dramatically over the past several decades. No doubt will continue to. Uh, there's been this 30 plus year downward trend in nominal interest rates, especially longer term nominal interest rates. And that got a boost during the financial crisis and it was this massive Rush to safety for Treasury securities, and then the Fed's balance sheet reaction buying lots of longer term Treasury securities, buying lots of mortgage backed securities. Um, but what's remarkable, to take it back to the fiscal side of things, and one place where the fiscal hawks are probably uh, uh, being again revealed to be a little bit too alarmist, is that interest expense as a share of GD GDP is actually much, much, much lower now than it was during the 1980s, despite the massive amount of extra debt outstanding. So if you think about the total interest expense as a combination of the price times the quantity, the price is so much lower that the massive increase in quantity uh, doesn't matter if you're just calculating uh, the interest expense as a share of GDP. Um, but what did the Fed do? So they cut interest, short-term interest rates all the way to zero and tried to push longer-term interest rates down further using uh, LSAPs, so or scale asset purchases, during a different conversation, possibly over beer, I will explain why I never referred to what the Fed did as QE. I am now the last person standing, I think, and part of me died when Ben Bernanke publicly referred to what the Fed did as QE. That ship has sailed. Um, but the theory inside the Fed at the time was what we're going to be doing is extracting duration risk from the market by buying longer term securities. Of course, what they were doing is they were doing an asset swap with the market. They were taking longer term securities, liabilities of the central authority that have a long, relatively long maturity, and with it, interest rate risk, duration risk, and providing to the market relatively short term liabilities of the central authority bank reserves. Uh, and the idea was with the central bank keeping short term interest rates at zero, if you can drive up the price of longer term securities, you drive down the yield and, 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 and you create more accommodative monetary policy. Um, so that's, 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 that's what went on. Um, now where we, the Fed's almost done with the unwind of the balance sheet, they publicly announced that September will be the, the end of when total assets in the balance sheet decline. And so the natural question is what happens next? Uh, the Fed has yet to determine, although perhaps Jim will enlighten all of us with what they're going to do with their portfolio of treasury securities in the steady state. And they've been talking about two competing hypotheses, either have their portfolio of treasury securities mirror the maturity distribution of treasuries outstanding under the belief that that would somehow be neutral to interest rates. I think those analytics are wrong, but nevertheless, it's a really good story and, and intuitively makes sense. Uh, or go back to what we used to do before the crisis, which is own securities all along the curve, but overweight holdings of short-term securities. What I find particularly interesting with that is, regardless of which of the two they choose, they're going to have to start to buy more short-term securities. And presumably in size, as a, as a quantitative example, um, the Federal Reserve currently owns zero Treasury bills. Treasury bills are roughly 15% of Treasury securities outstanding. So for the more conservative, just make your portfolio mirror the portfolio distribution of Treasuries outstanding, that would imply with roughly $2 trillion of a portfolio buying $300 billion in Treasury bills because the Fed currently owns none. That is a big number. Um, and the market's going to care, and the market is now starting to care, and they're going to care increasingly as time goes by, and as we get more information from the Fed, uh, it's going to matter. 
uh, to market pricing. What I find important to highlight is that the market tends to underappreciate that now the Treasury Department itself has a reaction function. This is <coughs> self-aggrandizing, so please bear with me. So I became Assistant Secretary for Financial Markets in 2014, uh, and the one thing that I'm most proud of for that time was actually enshrining a strategy for debt issuance in the Treasury Department. Uh, now, my uh, the people who have come after me, my successors, have done more to formalize it. You can see the minutes of the Treasury Borrowing Advising, Advisory Committee where they formalized it into a mathematical model, blah, 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 blah. But the, the short answer is, given the current setup that we live in where people are paying attention to the accounting of the debt, the deficit, and interest expense, um, boy, we should be trying to finance the federal government, finance the deficit in a way that minimizes expected costs uh, uh, over time. Um, and so what that means in practice is if the market wants to pay you a lot more for one particular type, type of security than they want to pay you for a different type of security, by all means, just provide more of the one that the market puts a premium on because you're both providing a public good and you're saving the taxpayer some money. And so as we got into 2014, 2015, Treasury bills are trading at a market premium to every other money market in instrument. If you were to fit a coupon curve and extrapolate it down to zero, bills are trading at a premium for <coughs> that. This was before we had money market mutual fund reform. This was before the forced uh, clearing of derivatives where people were demanding bills to post as collateral. So demand was high and rising. So we just increased the amount of bills outstanding by a few hundred billion dollars and, and save, save some money. So that's that's where the Treasury's mindset has evolved to. They still want to be, quote, regular and predictable and make relatively gradual moves, but nevertheless, there is a reaction function. So the Fed's gonna start buying Treasuries again in the secondary market in, in, in October. At some point, that pace of purchases is gonna go up probably first half of next year. Um, uh, but nevertheless, what they buy and where they buy is going to matter for markets, and I think people are going to start to pay even more attention, start to pay attention again to the Fed and wondering if they're meddling in financial markets, if they're distorting market prices, which for me has always been the most interesting <laughs> criticism of a central bank, because if you think of monetary policy as raising and lowering short-term interest rates, by definition, it has always been <laughs> distorting market prices by setting it at a level that you think is appropriate. Um, but I'll leave that as, as, as an aside for now. Um, so what could happen? Well, the Fed buys a lot of short-term debt, and short-term debt, as a result of market desires, market demand, goes up a lot in price on a relative basis. Treasury could easily adjust to in that direction. And so you might get, just out of two agents acting according to their own objectives, something that looks like coordination, even though in practice it's not. Um, I think one question that comes up a lot is, why, why would the Fed buy a lot of short-term debt? And one of the arguments that gets made is, remember what they were doing for the asset purchases, swapping with the market, taking away from the market longer term debt, giving the market short term securities, a version of that we did in explicitly was called at the time the maturity extension program or the so-called Operation Twist. Um, so there's precedent for it. Moreover, there's political pressure. The Fed is not a political institution, but nevertheless it is a creature of the Congress. It is accountable to the public and to the Congress. And a lot of people in Congress got really, really angry about the size of the Fed's balance sheet. So the maturity extension program was convenient because in face value terms, the balance sheet didn't change in size, and yet the same duration extraction was able to happen. And so maybe you want to set yourself up to be able to do that again the next time, heaven forbid, we have a recession. And as long as I'm not required to specify a specific time horizon, I'll forecast that we're going to have <laughs> um, so, but the counter argument that has been made, and most forcefully by, by, by Jim's colleague Charlie Evans, is that if the Fed in fact has a, a portfolio that has a shorter maturity, uh, uh, then we might be affecting where our star is, in some sense pulling down the, the neutral rate, and the idea is to, if, you have, if, if the only way to get to a shorter maturity portfolio is by essentially forcing the market to hold more longer term securities, then you're gonna steepen the yield curve and for any given setting at a short term rate, financial conditions are tighter. I'm gonna argue, I, I don't believe that that conclusion is at all obvious, and this is going to be another way to A, maybe take a small step back towards some of the MMT discussion, but by no means all of it. Um, uh, and, and moreover, it sort of points out that current convention uh, is not in any way etched in stone. 
So what, what is happening now? The Fed has a bunch of securities on its balance sheet in September. That's going to be it, no more decline. So every treasury security that they own will get reinvested. <laughs> and by law, currently, the Federal Reserve can't buy at auction from the treasury, but they can take maturing securities and roll them over, reinvest them in whatever securities are being auctioned on the same day. And that's exactly what's been happening at the convention now, is that you just do it on a pro rata basis. Well, the funny thing is, right now, given the specific, and this is tedious and technical, but kind of important, timing of what the Fed owns and what it matures, the Fed has been reinvesting into two-year securities, 10-year securities, and 30-year securities in equal proportion. That's a slight exact, or simplification, <coughs> but not by much. That's the convention. Instead, what the Fed could easily, well, what could easily happen, given the rules without violating the law but changing convention, is the Treasury could just roll all of those into two-year securities and not into 10s and 30s as well. That doesn't violate the law. It's only convention that has got us to the point where it's on a pro rata basis. And as a result, the Fed's balance sheet has more two-year securities than it does longer-term securities, all else equal. And moreover, these are all done as what, what's known in the business as an add-on. So the market never sees these. The, the, the Treasury Department says, how much do I totally need to sort of issue? How much of it is going to be for the Fed? And then the rest of it is how they size the auctions. And it's the auction size that determines the prices that primary dealers, like the guests, pay at auction. But you keep the auction sizes the same, which means presumably you keep pricing the same. But the Fed could end up with more short-term securities. And so you don't necessarily have to do anything at all Our star. And that seems like a reasonably straightforward, simple way of doing things. And I can hear now objections. When I was at Treasury, we would run this annual conference. And uh, at one point, Larry Summers uh, had a paper about how the Treasury Department was awful and they had undone at least a third of what the Fed was doing with its asset purchases. And shouldn't there be better coordination? And the standard response from Washington is, no, that's awful. If you cross that Rubicon, if there's any coordination between the Fed and the Treasury Department, you're going to have runaway rampant inflation probably the next day. It might not be back actually at 2% at some point. Um, uh, 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 but in addition to that, cats will start to sleep with dogs. People will compose atonal music, and the world will stop spinning on its axis. Um, I think there is a philosophical debate about what should be the interaction between a monetary authority, the monetary policy, and, and debt issuance. Should it be separated? Does it matter? I think it does matter. And I think given current legal and accounting frameworks and public perceptions, it's interesting and useful to keep things uh, separate. But that doesn't mean you should do this completely blindly. And so my approach to all of this is to say, boy, shouldn't we just have clear objectives for each institution? And the Fed has clear objectives, stable prices as defined by them as 2% inflation um, and uh, uh, full employment or, or maximum stable employment over time. Uh, the Treasury Department now has a pretty clear objective, minimize the cost of financing the deficit, uh, at least an expected value, uh, maybe subject to one or two constraints for, 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 for the public good. Um, but once you get to that point, I think, I think you're, you've got a fair amount of flexibility. So that proposal I had of the Treasury rolling over the Fed just into two is a, is a clear way that it doesn't do anything whatsoever to affect the Treasury Department's objectives. So if the Fed owns two years or the Fed owns 30 years, sure, on average, the 30-year pays a higher yield. But do you know what the Fed does with all of its net earnings? It gives it back to the Treasury Department. So either the Treasury pays the Fed a little bit less, and then the Fed gives the Treasury a little bit less because they have short-term debt, or the Treasury pays the Fed a little bit more because they've got longer-term debt, and then the Fed pays the Treasury a little bit more. That, that part doesn't matter at all. Um, uh, it's only what the, what, what the, the market price is uh, for the auction that affects what the Treasury's payments are. So I think in that sense, with clearly defined objectives for each institution, you can sort of come to these better outcomes without having to worry about the boogeyman of, of, of things going away. Um, and then the Fed could be free in the next downturn, heaven forbid, uh, to do the same sort of maturity extension program because as much of a in my view, intellectual fallacy it was last time and it will be in the future, the Congress does in fact care about the size of the Fed balance sheet. We had lots of debates in 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13 about you know, how big can the Fed's balance sheet get? Aren't there costs in to expanding the balance sheet? I always thought that was a bunch of hooey, um, which is a technical term. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, the world that I would like to live in is not necessarily the world that we live in. And if 
there is a political reality, why not respect it? It's not going to change meaningfully the, the outcome for the Fed. Um, but then it forces you to get back to this question, what is the Fed doing? They're changing the relative prices of different assets. Um, are they creating money? Are they printing money by doing asset purchases but not creating money if they sell short-term treasury debt versus buying longer-term treasury debt? I think that kind of distinction borders on, on the meaningless and really starts to um, muddy the, the issues. And I will last, uh, I will end with uh, the following thought, which is, uh, again, delving further into the, the philosophical, which is, if we think about that dichotomy that every money and banking textbook talks about, that every intro uh, that I know of, every intro macro textbook talks about, which is the stark, sharp distinction between bonds and money. Um, I, I find myself asking, well, is there really that much of a distinction? And people talk about, well, some treasury bills, because they're shorter maturity, are a lot more like money. So short-term debt is closer to money than longer-term debt. So then you start thinking, is that, is that really true? And what, what, what maturity does money have? And so for those of you who have spent time thinking about other systems or any economic history, you'll recall that England had, until very recently, a perpetual type of debt called the console. Right? No maturity, infinite maturity. So as far away as you could possibly get from money, right? infinite maturity. Now imagine it wasn't a, a, a coupon security that paid regular interest, but it was like a bill, so a bullet. It's just a zero coupon perpetuity, right? <laughs> We call that a dollar bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, so again, then, it forces me to ask on a philosophical level, why is there always this big debate about the sharp distinction between debt and money, when in fact, the longest maturity that you can ever have, that's a zero coupon, so not only is it long maturity, it's longer, long duration as well, um, is in fact the thing that most people most readily think of as cash. <laughs> First, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here. This conference, the Minsky conference, is always a highlight for me. I know for the first panel, I was furiously taking notes. Uh, uh, and I thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here on the Bard campus. It's so beautiful. It's a great time of year to be here. Um, I think the people who are following me are going to be talking about the Green New Deal. I'm here to talk about the Black Old Deal. Uh, and the black hole of the deal is the hidden hand of the too big to fail banks to achieve deregulation practically unknown to the U.S. taxpayer who will ultimately once again be called upon, whether they'll do it or not, I do not know, to pay the tab. Uh, the Institute for New Economic Thinking funded a paper I wrote, presented, on June uh, 19, 2018, it's got a very long title. It's Too Big to Fail Banks Regulatory Alchemy, Converting an Obscure Agency Footnote into an At-Will Nullification of Dodd-Frank's Regulation of the Financial Swaps Market. Um, I have a one-sheet piece of paper that has the site to the paper on SSRN. Uh, there, the presentation was done with Paul Volcker and Tom Honig, who supported my thesis. I have the presentation, a blog. There was an interview done by the director of INET after the, after the uh, presentation was made. And also, I have all the media that appeared <coughs> surrounding the presentation from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, what have you. Um, essentially, the point, and I, it's a long paper, and as a I will modestly say a very good introduction and summary that walked you through it. These other materials will help as well. But um, the, the starting point for the paper is that, and I have 300 footnotes to support this, that uh, most serious uh, analyses of the meltdown point to its cause to unregulated financial derivatives. Most the, the spark came from naked credit default swaps, which were famously written about by Michael Lewis in the big short in the movie uh, 
the big short, where people develop the idea of betting that mortgages would default even though they didn't own the mortgages. Uh, it was like going to a, 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 a football game and betting on who was going to win. Uh, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, after the uh, crisis, uh, figured out that some mortgages were bet on nine times to fail. So it wasn't just the default on the mortgage itself. Is somebody had to pay, and if you, if you created the big short bet, you got full payment of the mortgage, even though you didn't own it. Uh, now that's a financial swap. The inability to pay off those uh, obligations, AIG being the prime example, uh, had that allowed to rip through, rip through the economy, there would have been a massive systemic break. Uh, Messrs. Bernanke and Paulson clearly saw Bernanke famously having written about the Great Depression, saw this as the beginning of what would have been something like the Second Great Depression. As it was, we had the, the first Great Recession, which was bad enough as it was. Uh, the reason for this is that because of the something called the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which was introduced in the morning and passed in the afternoon of December 15, 2000, uh, swaps were certainly, for certain, completely deregulated at the federal level, almost all state level, including common law doctrines of fraud and lack of consideration were written out of uh, by federal statute. So going into the 2008 crisis, these swaps were not regulated. There was no capital. There was no collateral. There was no transparency. Certainly, the federal government had no idea what was going out there in the building up of these naked uh, credit default swaps. Uh, it came as a surprise on September 16, 2008. And one of the responses was TARP, but more importantly, I don't know what the correct word to use is. I use quantitative easing, but I, I stand to be corrected, uh, uh, was put into place. Money was thrown at the problem. I don't second guess that at all. But the reason money was thrown at the problem, nobody knew what the full scope of the problem was, because there was no recordation of the number of swaps that were collapsing. And Lehman shows us if one line of swaps collapses and uh, counterparties can't make good, they can't make good on interest rate swaps, currency swaps, energy swaps, the whole market disappears. Dodd Frank comes to the rescue. Excuse me, I have to say a drink of water. Thank you. Dodd Frank comes to the rescue. Uh, Dodd Frank comes to the rescue. Title seven of Dodd Frank. Uh, not as elegant as I would have liked, but I give it a B plus, said, OK, if there's going to be a swaps market, it's got to be transparent. When swaps are recorded, they have to be put in a depository so the regulators know what they are. Dealers and swaps have to have capital. Uh, they had no capital prior to 2008. They have to post collateral or margin. Wasn't done prior to 2008. They have to be cleared. Uh, I would say it's not an absolute rule, but 90% of swaps are cleared under Dodd-Frank. And if they're cleared, they have to be exchange traded, which becomes important because prior to that, you had bilateral contractual swaps with big banks, and there was no such thing as terminating the swap. If, you, if the swap turned against you, and many, many did, uh, you had a termination penalty, of accelerated payments of your obligation over 30 years of the swap contract and liquidated damages. Now with exchange trading, you can just, if you don't like what you're doing, you can trade out of the swap. You couldn't do that before. So this is all wonderful stuff. Uh, hurrah, hurrah. Uh, this Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which was principally in charge of implementing this, over a three year period put 50 rules in place by the way, clever provision in the uh, statute in Dodd-Frank put in by the banks was that no statutory provision applies to the rule that must be promulgated goes into effect. And it took three years to get these rules into effect. Last issue, 
what happens if a swap is traded abroad, outside the sovereign United States? There was a provision in Dodd-Frank that said if the swap can, if the failure, default on the swaps being traded can lead to a adverse effect on the financial economy of the United States, Dodd-Frank applies wherever the swap is put into place. If an extraterritorial transaction is an attempt to evade Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank applies. Now, I want to make clear my talk here today is about four big, two big to fail banks, Citi, Goldman, Bank of America, uh, and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. They have, if you figure the swap market, conventionally calculated, they have 90% of the swap market. They are systemically important. They were bailed out. They're in better shape now than they were before the meltdown. You're not, but they are. And they were rescued by the US taxpayer. Now, how much that rescue is, you can find any figure. My good friend Dennis Kelleher just put out a report that it was a $29 trillion rescue. Uh, there's a lot of debate about that. Let's just say a lot of taxpayer money was put on the table to rescue these banks. The last thing the CFTC did was, and their theory was, we can't tell you what extraterritorial impact it will have until we know what the regulations are. And they promulgated on uh, July 13, 2013, an 80-page, triple-column, single-space guidance on the extraterritorial application of swaps. The only thing that the two big to fail banks and market reformers, uh, like Better Markets and Americans for Financial Reform, agree on was that this guidance was incomprehensible. <laughs> now, that didn't bother the International Swaps Derivatives Association. Because on, in August 2013, they sent a letter to their swaps dealer members. And it said, footnote 563, 563 out of 660 footnotes, says, if a foreign subsidiary of a US swaps dealer is guaranteed, Dodd-Frank applies. Now, a foreign subsidiary. Now, that was not a remarkable statement because under the ISDA template for executing a swap, which if you're executing a swap, you have to use the ISDA template, uh, the ISDA template contemplates that all foreign subsidiaries of US swap dealers will be guaranteed by the parent. That is to say, the subsidiaries entering into agreements with third parties the third party can rest assured that, in this case, the US bank holding company will guarantee uh, the obligations of the subsidiary. Uh, that was the way the life was since 1992. Every foreign subsidiary of a US bank holding company swap dealer was guaranteed. In August 2013, ISDA sent out a letter and said, de guarantee all your foreign subsidiaries. And then you will not be covered by Dodd-Frank. It's the obverse of the statement that a guaranteed subsidiary is covered by Dodd-Frank. A de-guaranteed foreign subsidiary is not. And it took the CFTC about six months to find out this was happening. Because suddenly, the US swaps market declined, and nobody knew why was it declining. And slowly but surely, they figured out, and some, somebody let the cat out of the bag. A bank employee told the CFTC regulator, oh, you should see this wonderful letter we crafted and the new clauses we have in our agreements. It took the CFTC, I can't go through all the details, but that was May of 2014 when it was discovered. In June 2016, the CFTC issues a proposed rule that says, de-guarantee, de guarantee, guarantee it makes no difference if the subsidiary is on the books of the holding company, Dodd-Frank applies. Quickly, the CFTC also discovered this happenstance. 
The banks were arranging, negotiating, and executing the swaps in, on Wall Street. And then, after the swap was completed, sending it off to a de-guaranteed foreign subsidiary, taking the position, Dodd-Frank doesn't apply. Um, proposed rule comes out in May of 2016. Everybody thinking that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Hillary Clinton will be president and will finalize this. That rule has never been looked at again. We still live under a situation where if the swap goes off to the foreign subsidiary of one of the four big US bank holding companies, it is not regulated by Dodd-Frank. Now the banks will say, oh, but we're in the European Union. Well, we heard in the first panel how the European <laughs> Union is still. By the way, the European Union, if you talk to bankers, it's like nirvana, wonderful regulation. The US should only adopt those policies so we have uniform worldwide regulation. Uh, there are even more nightmares about the impact the European Union has had on swaps regulation. So you didn't know this. Virtually nobody knows this. Today, for all practical matters, Dodd-Frank's regulation of swaps is dead in the water. Now, that doesn't mean every swap will fall outside of Dodd-Frank, because some come voluntarily within the ambit. But if one of the four big bank holding companies does not want to follow Dodd-Frank, they at will can assign the swap to a foreign subsidiary, and it will be unregulated. Uh, Chris Dodd in January, uh, I think it was 2011, after he stepped down, gave a speech and said, you know, whenever I came to the floor to talk about Dodd-Frank and swaps, people would not come to me and ask me these very technical questions about how these regulations work. They would say, Chris, just tell us you know what you're doing. And that was evidence of the fact that nobody in the Senate knew what they were doing. Uh, my experience is very few people know what uh, swaps regulation is. It is completely unlike the securities uh, uh, laws, which have grown up since the New Deal. And people have been on both sides of the need to enforce. The people who understand swaps regulation are the banks. And they have an objective to escape regulation. I would finally say, uh, uh, Donald Trump, when he came into office, said, we're going to get rid of Dodd-Frank. We're going to unravel Dodd-Frank. There has been no serious proposal to unravel the Dodd-Frank swaps regulation. They don't need to un unravel it. By the way, this all happened under Obama, not under Trump. Not only do the banks not need to unravel it, but if they come forward with some proposal, there is bipartisan interest in reasserting Glass-Steagall. Now, is that interest rational or fully understood? No, it sounds good. We're going to separate the banks from the investment side and the commercial depository side. Uh, a lot of Republicans, they don't know what they're saying, but want to reinstate Glass-Steagall. If a legislative proposal comes forward to legislatively accomplish what's been accomplished through sleight of hand. Uh, they run, the banks run, run that risk. Interestingly enough, many of you may have seen uh, last spring, uh, Bill S-2155 uh, passed the Senate with 17 Democrats uh, supporting the Republicans. It broke a filibuster. And it, it was originally designed to reduce capital for community banks banks with $10 billion in assets or less. It was expanded, giving the Fed the discretion to reduce capital requirements for mid-sized banks, $250 billion or less. Uh, as it was going through, Citi and J.P. Morgan Chase said, why not us? Why shouldn't we get this capital relief? That provoked an unmitigated furor. The people, when they understand what's happening, do not want to see these banks 
being deregulated. In fact, at the city and J.P. Morgan shareholders meetings, shareholders were getting up and saying, what are you doing? You're putting the bank in our share. Well, in 2008, the shareholders didn't take a haircut, but they may take a haircut the next time. So they don't want this to happen. One week after J.P. Morgan Jace said, we want this too, Jamie Dimon got up and gave a speech at Howard University and said, let me be clear, S2155 is not for us. We're too big, it's for smaller banks. Uh, by the way, you're seeing now the Fed had the discretion to relieve capital requirements for mid-sized banks. They've taken that discretion. There's been a lot in the papers, whoa, we're going down the deregulatory road again. But if an issue is presented squarely so that the American people understand it, that is to say, Goldman, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Citi are going to be out of regulation of the very instruments that caused the 2008 meltdown, that is not going to go anywhere. The problem is getting people to understand the problem enough to be able to present it in that way. Thank you. parts of this uh, are not uh, completed yet. Um, what we're doing is presenting a different way to go about costing the Green New Deal. I'm sure that you're going to say this is very obvious. The question is, why isn't anyone doing it this way? Uh, it turns out to be a little more difficult than I originally thought, and we're actually going to have to use some of the same uh, data sources that Dan is using, so there is a pretty close relationship. Um, so calling it the big meow, the old people here will remember the, the reference, uh, Jimmy Carter's meow, which is a baby little kitten meow, he had inflation, oh my goodness, moral equivalent of war. Uh, this one is the moral equivalent of war, so that's the way we're looking at it. What matters is the resource availability. Ideally, we would uh, have a very fine measures of the resources that will be required to implement the Green New Deal, but for some of these areas, it's going to be very difficult to get those. So we're gonna fall back on largely labor resources, which are an important uh, part of the resources we're gonna need. Uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, Keynes' approach to how do we pay for the war, and that's relevant because this is like uh, a mobilization of the entire economy and society uh, to tackle the problems that the Green New Deal will be attacking. Uh, briefly present some wild estimates of other people on the costs. Uh, provide uh, our preliminary estimates of the resources and costs, very rough measures, um, and talk about how we might deal with any inflationary pressures if they might arise. Everyone is assuming that there will be massive inflation uh, due to the spending on the Green New Deal. We think that if you look at the resources that will be required, uh, it's <coughs> unlikely that the inflation pressures are going to be very big, but if they do arise, we need to be able to tackle those. So, uh, as I said, we're looking at this as the biggest challenge that the United States and the, the world economies have faced uh, since the 1930s and World War II. Um, last time around, we met the challenge. We did it. Uh, and so I think that we can learn from that. And if we could meet that challenge in the past, we should be able to meet this challenge uh, today. Um, there will be short-term sacrifices that have to be made, but I think that the long-term gains far outweigh the short-term sacrifices just as they did with our previous challenge. We came out of World War II uh, with very large long-term gains. So, the gains that we would achieve if we uh, met the challenge would be environmental sustainability, 
uh, greater equality, shared prosperity, jobs for all, health care for all, uh, child care for all, end of forever wars. These are the main components of the Green New Deal I'm going to emphasize. I, I know this is not a, a, a final product. Lots of things are being thrown out and, and included in the Green New Deal. These are the ones that we're going to be looking at. I, I just got this. Uh, uh, Bernie's, how are we going to pay for things? This is precisely what you don't want to do. I love Bernie, but this is the wrong way to go about it. Uh, we're going to rebuild America by taxing offshore income. That doesn't help at all. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much revenue you raise, it doesn't help at all. Remaking America, okay? Um, so let's look at Keynes. How do we pay for the war? During war, production and incomes increase, but the output available for consumption does not. In fact, it probably is going to shrink. Um, so we move from a time of plenty in the sense of, hey, we've got uh, insufficient aggregate demand, resources are plentiful, to a time of scarcity, uh, income and propensity to consume only slightly determine consumption in a time of scarcity. Planning for war is not a financial but a real resource problem. So first we have to determine how much output can we produce including mobilization of underutilized resources plus what we can import. Now I'll argue that we can't use that this time around. Back then we could. Okay? Because everyone faces the same challenges. Uh, how much of that is needed for the war effort, how much is left for private consumption, and therefore how much demand has to be withdrawn from the economy. Um, how do you reduce demand, according to Keynes? Taxes, rations, voluntary savings, and or deferred pay. And he, he goes through the pros and cons of each one of these, taxes and rations. The problem is they've got to be directed to the right place. Taxing offshore income is not going to solve our inflation problem. Okay, it has no impact. Um, so we've got to direct uh, to reduce the use of resources that we need for the Green New Deal effort. That's where the taxes have to go. Um, we might as well be taxing Martians, I say, as uh, the Bernie's list. The financial transactions tax. How does that reduce inflation? Okay, tax the Martians instead. Make it, if it makes you happy to tax somebody, tax Martians. Uh, voluntary savings. Uh, Keynes argued that uh, that's probably going to be inadequate. It requires collective, not individual action. Uh, if workers choose to spend more than what's available for consumption, so they're not saving enough, then prices go up, uh, and then there's going to be a wage price spiral. So I'll, I'll just cut to the, the chase. Um, so it's uh, likely that that is not going to be sufficient to uh, fight the inflation. Deferred pay. This is actually the preferred method, and this will be our preferred method also. Uh, workers earn deferred income, which can be used uh, to buy bonds. Prices won't rise, and the ownership of financial assets becomes more equalized. Um, workers increase their consumption after the war, which will help solve the problem of the slump that is almost certain to follow the war. Same thing with the Green New Deal. Some aspects of the Green New Deal are going to be permanent, but some are you know, one time, 10 year, one decade, investments we have to make. Uh, and so we need to deal with the slump that will follow this, and this is one way to do it, deferred earnings. So MMT approach, been mentioned a couple times. Uh, estimates of the Green New Deal uh, have been focusing on the financial costs of the various programs and wondering how are we gonna be able to afford to pay these things. Well, MMT approach, we don't need to tax the rich, we don't have to bankrupt the kids, we don't have to borrow from China, we don't have to get the Fed to print more money. Okay, none of those are necessary. A country with a sovereign currency has the financial wherewithal to afford whatever we know how to do. If we know how to reverse climate change, we can finance it. Uh, in fact, Foster may not be a name that many of you know, one of the greatest American institutionalists. Uh, whatever is technologically possible is financially feasible. If the financial system isn't capable of financing the Green New Deal, we need to change the financial system. If you think about what we did with uh, the housing markets, that's precisely what we did with the New Deal. The, we didn't have a financial system that would allow people to buy houses. We knew how to build houses. So we had to create a financial system that would finance home purchases. And we did that with the self-amortizing 
mortgage. So we can find a way to finance the Green New Deal if our current financial system can't do it. Now, I think we can. We, we already have a financial system that can finance this. Assessing the economic feasibility of the Green New Deal must be focused on technological know-how and not on the dollar cost. The important question is how can we mobilize underutilized resources and shift resources from destructive uses to constructive uses? And if necessary, how do we reduce private resource use to release resources to be used in the Green New Deal? So we provide a preliminary assessment that determine whether national resources are going to be sufficient to phase in the Green New Deal. Now resources and outputs are heterogeneous and this is what makes the problem complex. So conceptually you can see what we're trying to do. Uh, it's very difficult to do because uh, the outputs and the inputs are very heterogeneous. So we're, for the purposes of today, I'm going to be using dollars. That's not a very, very good way to measure your resources. Okay? Uh, eventually we will be able to do it in terms of labor. Um, still not ideal. Components of the Green New Deal, greening of the economy, so end of fossil fuel use, alternative energies, a new power grid to handle shifting much of this to electricity. Uh, transportation, greening of transportation, we need a new transportation system, and we need, need a, a public infrastructure that goes beyond that because we have to change people's behavior. We have to provide better recreational outlets than going to the shopping mall. Okay? Uh, Medicare for all, job guarantee, uh, job guarantee itself will provide a lot of the resources used for the greening programs, but also we're going to uh, provide care services for the environment, for uh, the community, and for people. Pavlina talked about that at the conference last year. We're going to end the forever wars, reduce inequality, tax the rich, raise income at the bottom, student debt relief, free public education, um, and universal child care. So these are the, the components that we're going to be trying to um, cost out. This is probably the most cited uh, projection of the cost. They come to 93 trillion. And then they very helpfully tell each household how much their taxes have to go up to pay for this. Okay. This is a, you know, what is this? Absolutely useless for figuring out whether we could afford the Green New Deal, whether we will, we will be able to save the planet. It's by design just supposed to scare you so that you won't even try. It's better just to go extinct because it's just so costly to try to uh, ensure human survival. I, that's what they're trying to do. Um, others have been um, providing much more reasonable uh, estimates, but they're still all about the financial costs. Uh, the Medicare for All, so the, the previous uh, slide, has that at $36 trillion. Uh, Blauhaus, I don't know if you know who he is, I know who he is. He's, his whole career has been spent trying to get rid of Social Security. Uh, and so obviously he wants to stop Medicare for All too. So he comes up with pretty high ones, but even he has to admit on some assumptions, you actually end up with savings if you shift off the current system to Medicare. Uh, or other assumptions will increase the cost by 1.2% of GDP. Uh, Perry has a, a report, they estimate 1.59% of GDP reduction. So we would move from 18% to uh, something a bit over 16% of GDP going to healthcare. Wool Handler, I, I think, has a, uh, is a, a much better analysis. And she may be one of the best people working on the American healthcare system has savings of 2.2 to 3.2 percent of GDP annually. We still be an outlier, way beyond what any other rich developed country uh, spends on health care, but that's a pretty big savings. Okay? Uh, job guarantee, uh, they put it at up to 45 trillion dollars to implement a job guarantee program. Uh, Darity has about 540 billion in their uh, report. Uh, Booker has uh, proposed a job guarantee, 540 billion, 43 billion. Last year we presented our report, it comes in at about um, 560 billion. Uh, the budgetary impact is about 400 billion. Uh, 
So that's about 2% of GDP, and we're going to run with that number. Okay, so it's about 2% of GDP. The greening estimates over uh, a 10-year period, okay, they've got it at uh, up to 6% uh, of GDP. There is a great variability in what is included in the greening, and that accounts for the wide range of the estimates. Uh, we, are, uh, we prefer the Jacobson one, which is one of the high ones, because they go to 100% uh, renewable uh, and no nuclear power, no natural gas. Um, so we are going to go with a, a higher estimate than the others. Medicare for all would be a significant uh, source of savings of resources. Use will go up marginally because we're going to be including more people in the healthcare system. And uh, people don't have to uh, avoid care because they're worried that their insurer won't uh, cover the care. So use will go up um, at least marginally. Uh, perhaps about 10% uh, is an estimate. The U.S. surprisingly doesn't use more services per capita. Many people think that that's why we uh, devote about twice as much of our GDP. Actually, Americans don't get more services. Uh, and except for obesity, uh, our health outcomes are not much different than European health, health outcomes. Um, the, uh, so more people will be covered, but the costs are going to decline um, uh, from 18% of GDP. The main differences, if you compare us to the other wealthy nations, are that we have an expensive for-profit insurance uh, as a, uh, one of the main uh, payers. Um, the net cost of insurance is about $150 billion annually. That's the difference between the premiums you pay in and the amount that they pay out. Uh, so that's about 0.75% of GDP. Um, compensation of healthcare workers is a lot higher. We're about double, we pay about double what uh, our peers pay healthcare workers. Uh, the administrative costs are very, very much higher. About 8% of total healthcare costs are administrative. A lot of that has to do with the extra billing that uh, is required to um, uh, pay through private health insurance. Um, depending on assumptions, Medicare for all could save 3.3%. So we're going to start with that, 3.3%. I think that's a very conservative estimate. And over time, we're going to move more towards uh, what the other peer nations do. So we'll continue to reduce uh, our share of GDP going to health Job guarantee, uh, it's a cost in financial terms, but it's a source of real resources for the Green New Deal. Uh, workers will be employed um, for infrastructure, uh, not huge infrastructure projects, that's not what job guarantee workers are gonna do, but they can do things like retrofitting and um, installing things. Uh, environmental uh, services, tree planting, and uh, again, the care services. Um, they, the job guarantee mobilizes labor resources that are not being used in the private sector. So this is a net addition of resources that we're uh, wasting right now. Um, we do believe we have a very generous job guarantee program. It is $15 an hour. And there will be uh, a few hundred thousand workers that are going to be shed by the private sector as wages are bid up. Uh, but for the most part, most of the workers in this program, 15 million workers, will be people who are not currently employed. It's difficult to uh, calculate potential supply. Uh, if we just go by the dollar figures, the net uh, impact on the budget is about 400 billion. Uh, we assume that uh, the uh, value of the resources toward, going toward the Green New Deal projects is only about 1% of GDP. Other components uh, that we're including in the Green New Deal, student debt relief. There's a Levy report that came out last year on that, so we're using the data from there. Uh, I won't go through that. Um, the, uh, our argument is that uh, this is going to help people get their lives in order, start families, and get settled down earlier, so this is probably actually adding resources that are available, but we're not going to count anything from this. Free college, everyone uh, agrees, college pays for itself. So in terms of uh, resources, uh, whatever resources we have to devote to uh, 
more classes, more professors, all that, uh, will be more than made up for by the increased productivity of workers um, who have college educations. Uh, same for public infrastructure. Uh, the IMF says that a, a dollar of investment gives you three dollars of um, output. So again, we're going to count that as zero uh, because whatever resource we put in the infrastructure, we're going to get back. Uh, tax the rich, well, that would free some resources, but I think it's so insignificant that uh, we're not going to count that. So we count that as no net source of resources that are freed up because somebody doesn't buy the third yacht. Yeah, yeah there will be some, but we're not going to count them. Uh, universal child care, we're going to assume that that pays for itself too in terms of a very long term uh, enhancing the productivity of people who get decent child care when they're young. So to conclude, uh, summary of the resource costs. So here the, the positive are um, use of resources for the Green New Deal. The negative are sources of resources that are used for the Green New Deal. So the greening projects are about 5% of GDP. The reduction of resource use in the medical care system will be 3.3%. The job guarantee is a source of resources, about 1% of GDP. Ending forever wars, it's, it's hard to get good numbers on this. It's hard to know uh, exactly what the spending on war is because it's included in lots of budgets that are outside the Defense Department. Uh, so we're putting a very conservative number on this at 1% of GDP. So the net resource costs are actually negative. Okay. We could be wrong. <laughs> so, caveats. The released resources might not be appropriate. Okay, that's going to be a problem. Uh, we're going to stop fracking and we're going to put in solar power. Are the resources that are now fracking very well suited to installing solar power? Maybe not. So, uh, they, it may take resources to train or retrain workers to do the kinds of projects that we New Deal needs. Uh, as I said, we can't rely much on imports. Uh, we are obviously doing that right now for solar uh, power. We're going to have to start producing our own uh, because everybody needs solar power. So we can't rely on imports for this. We might be underestimating the inflation threat, in particular <coughs> shifting health care uh, to government creates uh, large savings to employers and some savings to employees. I'll come back to that. So what happens if we reduce uh, the resources in the healthcare system by 3%? Doesn't that increase consumption by 3%? Um, so if, if we do get inflation pressure, uh, what should we do? Let's say taxes. Uh, we need targeted taxes. So turnover taxes, offshore income taxes, co corporate profit taxes, high wealth taxes, carried income taxes, those are all the progressives' popular taxes. None of those help, okay? So that's not, I'm not against them, let's do it, but the purpose is not to free up resources and fight inflation, it's because rich people are too rich. That's the only justification for these kinds of taxes. Taxes on consumption are what you need. Taxes on wages would be effective, but they're politically unpopular and they're unfair because wages have been stagnant and uh, <clears throat> actually declining for a very large part of the population. So I don't think that we should tax wages for this. Um, shifting health care to the government. Uh, so people argue that uh, the, uh, since employers pay most of that, uh, eliminating the private insurance is going to lead to a huge windfall for employers. So of course they're going to raise wages. Well, those aren't the kinds of employers that I see offering any time. They're not going to raise wages. It's going to be a windfall profits that go to the employers. So there is probably some justification in um, taxing that. So this is the last slide. Uh, I think that uh, Keynes's proposal to defer compensation is the best thing to do. And what is the best way to defer the compensation? Uh, so one way would be every individual worker uh, holds the bonds, which was his recommendation. I think that what we need is a, a social approach to deal with an aging society in which Social Security is not adequate for the majority of people 
So we need to guarantee a decent retirement for all, de-link the benefits from the um, earnings over uh, the qualifying periods, or at least boost the benefits in a highly progressive manner. Because the problem really is people with low earnings uh, do not get enough Social Security to live on. Uh, so Bernie has proposed, it was in the slide, 6.2% uh, new payroll tax on an, uh, employers and 2.2% on employees to pay for it. So I'm not advocating it to pay for it. Okay, this is not to pay for the program, but let's go ahead and put the tax on okay, in order to reduce demand. Uh, the one on the employers is just to take back those windfall, pro windfall profits that they're going to get, and then on employees to reduce their demand a bit. But with the, uh, the promise of much better retirements for them. So it's not to pay for any of the uh, programs. It's deferred compensation. It's Keynes' sinking fund uh, that's not used to finance future spending but to reduce aggregate demand now. So that's how we would do it. There. Okay, we've got about 20 minutes for questions from the floor. Okay. Where, where are my microphones here? George, got it? Antonio, give one to the guy with the hat over here. <laughs> George, bring a couple over here. Scott, question to you. Uh, why wouldn't you want to flip the script on what you described? In other words, if you believe over the long term, subject to losses, capital losses, if interest rates are normalized over the long run. So you take away an intermediate macro problem that you're going to run into if the Fed does what it says it wants to do, and if it really wants to get out of the business of using this balance sheet, it has to do, if we're going to use monetary <coughs> policy as a counter-cyclical policy lever. Does that make sense? So parts of me, so I guess one thing is Treasury issuing long and the Fed buying long, I mean, whatever the Treasury issue Fed ends up holding is necessarily debt that the market is not holding. So as a result, it doesn't have any effect on <coughs> prices. So conditional on whatever the Fed's going to have on its balance sheet, what maturity that has first and foremost, or sort of on, on average, isn't going to matter as much. It's going to be what does the Treasury do with the rest of what it is that they're issuing that is going to go to the market that they're going to have to decide on. Uh, and there, yeah, I think they should find a way to minimize expected cost. Uh, I guess I'm just unconvinced is that direct link that the Fed being buying the longer term stuff is gonna gonna help that much because the Treasury can just react. They get to later. But don't you want to take the financial stability risk of normalizing interest rates off the private sector? Because not everybody's a buy and hold investor in the private sector of Treasury debt. And unless you are, you're subject to capital losses if you normalize interest rates, right? So ab ab absolutely. So couple of points. One, the Fed may have already normalized interest rates. That remains to be seen. Uh, second, the extra term in the Phillips curve, or in the uh, Taylor rule for financial stability, I'm pretty skeptical anybody's figured out exactly very clearly what that means. So if the tool of monetary policy is short-term interest rates, and one additional objective is financial stability, I hear all the time, and I can easily make the argument that a very, very steep yield curve is bad for financial stability because people engage in maturity mismatch and that's very, very bad. You can also make the argument that a very, very flat yield curve is bad for financial stability because when the yield curve is flat, people go out the risk curve in order to make yield, get yield pickup. And so we're left with raising short-term interest rates is bad for financial stability because it flattens the yield curve. Keeping short-term interest rates low is bad for financial stability because it gives you a steep yield curve. And more specific historical example, you'll remember over the course of the 2000s, the Fed was hiking interest rates at what at the time seemed like a staggeringly 
snail's pace of 25 basis points a meeting, now that seems fast in comparison. Got all the way up, you know, in 2006, you got the funds rate up to five and a half percent or wherever it was. And remember, that just cleared out all financial stability risks in the system. I mean, except for 2008. But apart from that, <laughs> apart from that it's clear that raising short term interest rates got rid of financial stability risks. Uh, so I don't know, I'm, that, that linkage to financial stability and, and short term uh, interest rates is totally wrong. Okay, over here. Uh, Dan, can you talk about the linkage between? So, so at the end of the day, what is what? Why do people buy treasury? And I know people trade, but at the end of the day, most people, uh, mo most money flows to treasury is because of the lack of capital, capital investment opportunities. Uh, and and uh, you know the tenure, to me, is just merely a reflection of whether or not there are of whether or not the capital opportunities are plenty or scarce. Uh, and in the current environment, I think for a very very long time. Therefore, they have declined. So the connection between the two, obviously, is if you have low capital investment, low job, low high quality job creation, uh, and those things, you know, trade together. It'd be very interesting over time as we continue to look at that correlation to see whether or not it's predictive or just follows on. We actually have found periods during which it's during which it's very predictive, uh, and uh, and other periods. So we're, we continue to work on it, but it's uh, it's very good. Okay, here's what the general okay. says. Uh, I may be coming from a place of just absolutely incomprehensible idealism, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that it's a good place. <laughs> <laughs> universal health care more than pays for itself. I mean, if you think of Mother Nature as venture capitalist, and the people that she gives capital to as actually trying to um, do good rather than just make profit. And you think of Mother Nature endowing, I mean, capitalizing a um, universal health care for West Virginia and Kentucky. And that somebody simply starts offering universal health care at less than corporations now pay for uh, insurance. Um, that that will then draw, you'll know, you get all these premiums, given that the, uh, the companies will go for the better deal. And you figure out how to pay for the people who can't pay for it. But you get premiums coming in of 10% of GDP, you know, for that local area. And you have you have a capital account, so you actually have investable capital coming in about, out of that. I mean, that's the way insurance companies make their money, by investing these premiums that they haven't paid out yet. And it seems to me that that, uh, you get buy-in without going through the political system. I mean, the mother nature is people who actually want to invest capital in something that does some good. Um, I don't know. This is this is wildly out of. But it, in the, the insurance industry used to be aid for Lutherans buying insurance for their people, and then people came in and figured out how to buy off the management. Yeah, it used to be insurance property. property. So anyway, do you get Randy, the idea of where you're you going from? You want to take this? Well, I mean, the the problem with insurance is cherry picking. So the the competition leads to uh, you know you. But you come in and you limit pricing. You price below what anybody else will do. You but you you won't make it because someone will come in and take the best the healthiest people away from you. So you'll then, end up then, with you can, then, then you can pass legislation to people who are doing that. Well, we sort of tried that with Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then yeah. the, the other problem is you make profits by denying claims. 
okay? Not by covering health care, by denying claims. But you make profits by not spending all that money on deciding who gets benefits. You just pay the benefits and run the real side rational. That, that was the original idea we had Blue Cross. Yeah. And, and, and then people came in and sure. they bribed management to to cherry pick. And, and you know, I don't I don't know if you're going there, but there you know, there is another way of looking at the whole health system in, in, in terms of the, the argument we call the single price. Um, you know, we, we talk about single payer Medicare for all But the what the only thing that I've ever found that any sense to in terms of continuing on with the private sector. I'm sorry, continuing on with the private sector. Uh, payment system uh, is is to effectively allow Medicare to control prices, effectively allow Medicare to set the price and force everybody into that into that price uh, context. And and you know again, I, I think the political challenge is the same uh, at, at the end of the day. But that's the only way that, that I've been able to wrap around. We have time for one more question. Just here. add to what he said. The, the divergence between the prices paid by the private insurers and by the government insurers is widening over time, which is why our Who is Scott? Are Antonio, you got the mic to the gentleman right over here. Well, on the Green New Deal, how do you sell that when half the country, the, the pushback is it's socialism, and half the political party, the one of the political parties is already using that, as opposed to what I think most people in this room are seeing it, it is the equivalent of World War II. The difference with World War II is you can see Pearl Harbor, you can see the bombings in Berlin and so on. I'll make the point, you can also see the hurricane activity and the flooding and so on. So how do you sell that to 350 million people when half of us, half of them are gonna say this is socialism, we don't want it. The, the support for the Green New Deal is growing. It's growing over time as people see the climate. So I, but Green New Deal includes lots of other things. They're also very worried about inequality. They're also very worried about their student debt. So all the things that I talked about, the awareness of all these things is growing. Do I think this is going to pass within the next two years? No. Okay, one last question. Last one in. Alex, make it short, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The question is for, for, for Seth uh, Carpenter on um, on basically the there was a recent uh, working paper from uh, Josh Mason and Arjun Jayadev basically arguing that if you um, you can do functional finance without the sort of MMT trappings by switching the instrument assignment of debt sustainability and uh, full employment between the Fed and the Treasury, and basically arguing that a central bank that sets its own interest rates uh, can ensure sort of indefinite debt sustainability in terms of interest rate share of payments, while um, you know wages and unemployment are more sensitive to fiscal policy uh, in like the near term. And I was curious if you had any opinion on that versus a sort of de facto, if not de jure, uh, cooperation between the Treasury and the Fed. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I guess. That's, that's a great question, and I think some of the debate and some of the more people talk past each other are a little bit of sort of who's doing which role, and I think there was, for a while, a lot of uh, support in different areas that activist fiscal policy became an important part of counter-cyclical macro policy, sort of stimulating it a downturn, pulling things back in, 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 in times of boom. Um, I think ultimately that's, that is an empirical question to be answered by economists as much as by political scientists, and I think another part also comes in where some people talk past each other a little bit on how, how big a deal MMT is or should be made is, you know, if inflation is a limiting factor, you know, what is the, the sensitivity of inflation in a given economy to aggregate demand? Uh, I'm often slightly amused by Larry Summers' criticisms of MMT when he can then pivot and say, but of course we need to do a lot more fiscal policy to make sure we're at full employment, it won't be an inflation problem because we have a second <laughs> to a first approximation, and for any single policymaker's firm, doesn't 
Okay, I thank the panel for their very inspiring presentation.